everyone, this is Kelly Mara here. I can't believe I actually made it through 2020 and not only that, I actually managed to hit 3k on my channel in such a short amount of time. I even started a Discord server. The link is in the description if you're interested in joining a community of amazing, lovely people who love art and drawing. And after everything I've gone through this year, I feel a little daring. So. For my first video in 2021, we are going to be talking about a very sensitive topic that I've always wanted to speak on for a very long time. After my video about Hopeless Peaches and Creepshow art blew up, there was one comment that really stuck with me. A comment that had a lot of merit that I felt I should have handled better in that video with how briefly I addressed it and poorly structured my points surrounding it further down the line. To give you some context on what was said, here it is. Because this is a serious issue, I want to point out that just because she didn't follow through with the act, it doesn't mean that she was lying or faking it. I've been in similar situations before where I felt like taking my own life and I'm very thankful that I didn't. But you know what I did when I was going through all of that? I went to my local GP and talked about it with a mental health nurse, and he gave me a fresh perspective on my thoughts and feelings and offered me resources to seek more help. And he also made sure that I was safe and that I knew I was safe. I did not, however, post it onto Twitter for the whole world to see because when I was going through that experience, I didn't want anyone to know. The reason why people say she was faking suicide is because a reasonable person wouldn't have publicized such sensitive information onto the internet and what's worse is that Peaches then has the gall to say that if she were faking it, she would have been more blunt about her intentions? What the actual fuck? As you can probably see, I was pretty worked up about the issue. This is a topic that has affected me and people very close to me, so I got quite defensive and angry when I heard what Peach has said, though perhaps unfairly so. And people rightly called me out for this. Although I intended for this to be me recounting my personal experience with suicidal ideation, I understand that it could be interpreted as me saying, people who really want to commit suicide don't talk about it, which brings us to the comment I received. I want to thank them, first of all, for bringing up this perspective because I genuinely missed it in writing the script for my previous video. Silverheart Pro said, I would like to add a small correction about the tired line that real people with suicidal thoughts don't talk about it, if only for how common and pernicious it is. It's actually incredibly common for people experiencing suicidal thoughts to reach out even to strangers, especially if they're feeling socially isolated. They turn to anyone who might help them get through the rawest emotions in the moment so they can go on. While repeated and excessive behavior like this is definitely a red flag, it's usually only people who have planned out and intend on following through with a suicide attempt that stay quiet. This of course isn't the same for everyone. There are many people who do keep self-harm and suicidal thoughts to themselves due to societal stigma and pressures, but it's not a catch-all. I thought this was an excellent point and evidently a lot of people also agree. Because of that, I thought I should expand on this issue further in its own video. Mental health is a topic I'm genuinely very passionate about and want to educate people on. I just never found the right way to do it. As I mentioned briefly in my previous video about Hopeless Peaches, I am a nursing student in my final year of education. By next year, I hopefully will have graduated and be setting my sights into applying for medicine. I completed my mental health course last year and I even got to work in a mental health ward for two weeks for my clinical placement. The course was what really inspired me to make my comic, Amber Hills, in the first place, as I felt that there is so much misinformation and glorification being spread around by TV shows and Hollywood movies. and. I wanted to be able to present my perspective from a health professional standpoint. And as I also mentioned in my previous video, a big part of healthcare is providing education, as prevention is better than cure. Because not only does it allow the allied health team to perform their duties as well as they do, it also provides patients the ability to take control of their own health. 
However, this in no way means that I am competent enough on the subject to provide professional counseling or diagnose anyone. I'm still a student and that is way beyond my scope of practice, even after I graduate. If you feel unsafe, I implore you to seek professional help right away, be it by going to your family doctor or calling a suicide hotline. However, as a student, I am given access to very helpful educational resources that the general public may not know about or have access to. And it is this information that I want to share with you all today. Before we begin, I would like to create a distinction between suicidal ideation and suicidal intention. Although suicidal ideation heavily contributes to suicidal intention, suicidal ideation alone does not always indicate intention. In other words, just because someone may be visualizing killing themselves, it doesn't necessarily mean that they do want to die. Also, because my education is in Australia, most of the resources I have are based here. However, that isn't to say that these resources aren't available to you or are relevant to you just because you're not in the Australian region. The articles I will be citing in this video are scholarly, peer-reviewed research that have been published in accredited health journals, and they will all be available in my description if you want to have a look. But with all that being said, let's talk about depression and online coping. So, what is mental health? It's a term we hear all the time online, especially on YouTube and Twitter. It might surprise you then that the term mental health is frequently misunderstood. Mental health is often used as a substitute for mental health conditions such as depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, and others. According to the World Health Organization, Mental health is a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So rather than being about what's the problem, it's really about what's going well. This information can be found on the Beyond Blue website, which is a free mental health support service for youths based in Australia. It provides information about depression, anxiety, and suicide, both for those experiencing these tendencies and for those concerned that someone they know may be experiencing them. They offer a lot of helpful articles and counseling services, and I highly recommend checking it out if you need it, or if you want to help someone you know. However, seeing that most of my audience comes from the USA, you probably won't be able to make use of the telephone services they offer, but they do have an online chat service you may be able to access. Or if anyone watching knows of any helpful online resources in their area, please feel free to drop them in the comments below. There is such a broad range of conditions that I believe it warrants their own video someday. However, something I learned from my course is that there are seven major categories, psychosis and schizophrenia, anxiety disorders, personality disorders, eating disorders, substance-induced mental disorders, perinatal mental disorders or mental health disorders brought on by pregnancy and childbirth, and finally, the topic we are looking at today, mood disorders, specifically speaking, major depressive disorder. Mood disorders in general are one of the most prevalent mental health disorders, with women being more likely to experience them than men. Now, there are many things that can result in the development of depression. There are biologic, psychologic, social, and environmental factors at play. Biologic factors can include genetics, chemical imbalances in the brain, or hormonal imbalances in the body. Psychologic theories propose notions such as learned behaviors through modeling and imitation, removal of positive reinforcements or specific cognitive distortions such as negative thought patterns in response to the environment. And with social factors, these are things such as stressful life events, abuse, and poverty. 
Recent studies have found a five-fold increase in the number of students disclosing mental health conditions since 2007. From 9,675 in 2007 to 2008 to 57,305 in 2017 to 2018 and growing pressures on student mental health services. In this article by Gunnell, Kidger, and Elvidge, published in the British Medical Journal, they state that a growing number of UK and international studies show that affective disorders in young people are rising substantially, particularly among girls and young women. A recent UK analysis reported a 68% increase in hospital self-harm presentations in 13 to 16 year old girls between 2011, 45.9 per 100,000, and 2014, 76.9 per 100,000. Causes of the escalation are uncertain. Some studies point to a rise in presentation and diagnosis rather than a true increase in incidence. More people self-reporting problems may partly reflect greater willingness to share feelings, such as suicidal thoughts, due to better mental health literacy. The key word here is mental health literacy, which basically means how knowledgeable someone is on mental health. This is the point I failed to acknowledge in my previous video, or at the very least, very poorly articulated. There is a widespread misconception that access to social media has only negatively impacted the current generation's mental health. We hear it all the time that Instagram exacerbates body dysmorphia in young adults and adolescents, Twitter promotes dangerous ideologies and behaviors, and Facebook is overrun with misinformation and hoaxes. Which isn't to say that it isn't true, but in that sea of negativity, it's easy sometimes to forget about the positives. A study by Fergie, Hilton, and Hunt in 2015 investigated the perceptions and experiences of engaging with health information online in a sample of young adults familiar with social media environments in consuming user-generated content. The results found that although participants primarily discussed well-rehearsed approaches to health information seeking online, their accounts also reflected active engagement with health-related content on social media sites. Navigating between professionally produced websites and user-generated content, many of the young adults seemed to appreciate different forms of health knowledge emanating from varied sources. Participants described negotiating health content based on social media practices and features and assessing content in a hands-on manner. Some also discussed habitual consumption of content related to their condition as integrated into their everyday social media use. Thanks to social media, information on mental health disorders are more accessible now more than ever. And this has helped many young adults to identify their symptoms, better manage them, and hopefully get help. However, given how anecdotal most informational posts are on the internet, it is just as easy for misinformation to spread, resulting in misunderstandings and unwarranted harassment. As stated in this correlational study done by Berryman, Ferguson, and Negi, published in 2018 on Psychiatric Quarterly, in recent years, many parents, advocates, and policymakers have expressed concerns regarding the potential negative impact of social media use. Some studies have indicated that social media use may be tied to negative mental health outcomes, including suicidality, loneliness, and decreased empathy. Other studies have not found evidence for harm or have indicated that social media use may be beneficial for some individuals. And so, to examine this phenomenon in greater depth, they conducted a correlational study examining 467 young adults for their time spent using social media and the importance of social media in their lives. The results they found may actually surprise you. Or maybe it won't. Social media use is an important element of the developmental process for youth and young adults as they interact with others and present their forming identities online. The study showed that overall, social media use is a poor indicator of mental health problems, and the concerns surrounding social media causing mental health crises may be unwarranted. In fact, parent-child conflicts were more predictive of mental unwellness, suicidal thoughts, and loneliness. 
social desirability was consistently associated with less reporting of negative symptoms. Social support was a consistent protective factor for all negative outcomes, including suicidal thoughts. And although the need to belong was associated with the most negative outcomes, it also increased the individual's empathy, which may reflect an over-eagerness to identify with others to gain their approval, but also reduce their suicidal thoughts. However, what I found most interesting was that histrionic personality traits, which is an overwhelming desire to be noticed and often behave dramatically or inappropriately to get attention, was actually a protective factor for social anxiety and loneliness. It makes sense that being socially desirable online and having a strong social support would protect from negative outcomes, like suicidal thoughts, but I didn't think that it would be the case for let's just say, dramatic people. And after reflecting on it for a little bit, I realized that this was exactly what Silverheart Pro and so many others were talking about in that comment thread. Some people have mentioned that it's a coping mechanism for them, that there is safety in the anonymity of telling strangers about their problems, that there is comfort in knowing that you won't ever have to face that person again after what you've told them and that it won't change how people treat you in your personal life. Some have even mentioned that it's because the people in their lives don't pick up on it or don't really seem to care. I suppose, and this is my own personal hypothesis, this is where histrionic personality traits come from. It's normal for people to be dramatic on the internet. It's normal for people to talk trash, rant, or spam their thoughts online, and as the study proves, having a medium to air those thoughts genuinely help. I think social media has pretty much become that medium for most people. Twitter has pretty much become a garbage dump for people to dispose of their daily frustrations onto, which, looking at it with this newfound perspective, I can actually get on board with. If it helps people to do it, does it really deserve the criticism it receives? In a way, I think, yes. Although posting that information isn't what causes mental health crises or breakdowns as we've established, it in fact prevents negative outcomes, it's what people say in response that does. Twitter is a public platform. Therefore, anything you post online, anyone can see. Just as you have that safety in anonymity, so do other people. And sometimes, not everyone will have the best intentions or the kindest words to say in response. And just as with everything else, when you put yourself out there, there will always be people who disagree with you or judge you. It's like a double-edged blade. Which leads us to the crux of the matter. You see, that wasn't all the study was looking into. In addition to time spent on social media and the importance of it in the lives of the participants, it also investigates the tendency to engage in vague booking. The authors define vague booking as posting unclear but alarming sounding posts to get attention, which is the phenomenon that Silverheart Pro mentioned in their comment. The best example for this, of course, being Hopeless Peach's Twitter post from her now deleted Twitter account. You see, Although the results of the study revealed that, overall, social media had no significant negative outcome for mental health, there was one exception. And as you've probably guessed, that exception was vague booking, which predicted loneliness and suicidal thoughts. The author stated that it is possible that some forms of social media use may function as a cry for help among individuals with pre-existing mental health conditions and potentially serve as an identifiable risk marker for those problems. If that sounds familiar, then you might remember that that was also what Peaches said on her now-deleted response to Prison Mate Luke and Creepshow Art. An example of vague booking behavior includes posting social networking updates that prompt friends to ask what's going on. It is a coping mechanism that is fairly common among those with suicidal ideation. However, it is still a behavior that I disagree with that I also think we should try to reduce moving forward. Now, I understand that at that stage, it's an act of desperation. You feel that you're on a tightrope losing your balance above a yawning abyss and you just need to be noticed and to know that someone cares. 
to know that people don't want you to disappear. Which, at that stage, whatever it was you were doing to cope before, it's not enough anymore. Twitter isn't enough anymore. And I'm here to tell you, so that if you do find yourself in that situation someday, you'll know what to do. To prevent something, you need to know when things are going wrong. That way, we can catch it in an earlier stage where it's more manageable. It's understandable to believe that something is normal when you've been experiencing them all your life, but just know that that's not how things are supposed to be. Signs to look for include social withdrawal, a persistent drop in mood, disinterest in maintaining personal hygiene or appearance, uncharacteristically reckless behavior, poor diet changes, rapid weight changes, being distracted, anger, insomnia, alcohol or drug abuse, wanting to give away sentimental or expensive possessions, hopelessness, failing to see a future, believing that you're a burden to others, feeling worthless or alone, and talking about death or wanting to die. This also extends to anyone watching who may not be experiencing these symptoms themselves but are worried about someone they think might be. If you start noticing two, three, or even one of these signs, then it's time to look into getting help. Maybe finding someone you trust who you can talk to, or if you don't have that person, looking into outside resources such as mental health clinics, online mental health support services, or suicide prevention apps. Yes, they exist. And if you notice that these signs are present in someone you know, then it's time to speak with them. Beyond Blue also has a page specifically about talking to someone you're worried about. I highly recommend you guys having a peruse of it yourself, but essentially it comes down to knowing when to ask, how to ask, being prepared for the answers, and making a safety plan. If you know the person in real life, it's important to choose a time and place where you can talk openly and easily without interruptions. It's important that you don't have to be anywhere or have other commitments. It might take a long time for this person to have this conversation and the most important part is that they feel like they're being listened to. Ideally, you and your friend or loved one needs to be calm to be able to have this conversation, so make sure the time is right for you too. Some suggestions include maybe going over to their house, doing something you enjoy together, going for a walk or going for a drive. If you're online, contact them directly and send them a private message. It's still okay to talk, just not in public. If you feel worried about someone, asking whether they are thinking about suicide won't put ideas in their head. Your friend or loved one will probably feel relieved at being heard and understood. Next, let's talk about what to say and what not to say. These are examples of what you should do. First is ask the direct question. Are you having thoughts about suicide? Be prepared when that person may answer yes. Then listen with empathy and without judgment. Keep asking open-ended questions, encouraging the conversation. How long have you been feeling this way? Have you felt this way before? Don't ask questions that they can easily answer with a yes or no. Make sure the person knows you're there for them. Use nonverbal cues like eye contact, hand on their hand, nodding while they're talking. Let the person know that lots of people think about suicide and that it's okay to talk about those feelings. You're not alone. Lots of people feel like this. Thank you for telling me. I'm glad you're telling me how you feel. Try to offer hope and suggest that people can find ways to get through tough times. I'm here. We can find a way to get through this. Reassure your friend or loved one that you're here to listen and support them and that you don't need to rush off. Just take your time. There's no rush. I know talking about this can be difficult. I'm here to listen. You can tell me anything. Be prepared to listen. Even if it's hard to hear, or even if it makes you upset. Find out if they've made a plan. This is very important. 
People who have made a plan are at more risk. Ask them, have you thought about how you would kill yourself? Have you thought about when you would kill yourself? Have you taken any steps to get the things you would need to carry out your plan? In contrast, here are some examples of what you shouldn't do. Don't try to talk them out of suicide by reminding them what they've got going for them or how much it would hurt their friends or family. Don't try to fix their problems. Listen with empathy and without judgment. Don't dismiss it as attention-seeking. Take them seriously and acknowledge the reasons they want to die. Next, you should be prepared for when the conversation doesn't go exactly as you planned or had hoped. Some things to consider are, what if they deny there's a problem? What if they don't want to see a professional? What if they're not okay? To get some advice on these possibilities, I've provided a link in the description to the Beyond Blues page on this topic. Finally, you should make a safety plan even if they're okay. A safety plan basically puts all your coping tools together in a series of steps to prevent your next relapse. These steps include recognizing your warning signs. This can include any of the things I listed before or something unique to you that you know happens when something is about to go wrong. Next, make sure your surroundings are safe. Um, so this means putting away any sharp objects, anything you could hang or harm yourself with, locking windows and all of that. Finding reminders of reasons to live. It's good to make a list of these things and to keep close to you at all times or just have an easy access. It is also important to keep a list of people and places that you connect with that you can go to or visit to help you clear your mind. And finally, seeking professional support. Beyond Blue has also made a very helpful video describing in better detail what safety plans are and how to create one which I have linked in my description. In conclusion, how individuals use social media is more important than time spent online in regards to mental health. Hours spent researching topics to better educate yourself is time well spent. Despite how readily available this information is to the public, however, not enough people are aware of it. Instead, popular media, suicide advocates, and policymakers continue to hone in on time spent online as a cause of mental health problems, which is a detrimental flaw given the lack of clear evidence for this relationship. However, if you made it to the end of this video, then hopefully you are better equipped to help yourself and others around you. And I hope that with this knowledge, we can tackle 2021 stronger than we were in 2020. That is essentially the end of my video. I know it's a very serious and not really entertaining video, but this is honestly something I've always wanted to do even before I started YouTube. So I'm really glad that um, no matter what happens, I actually got to do it. I hope that this video has helped you or basically gave you the knowledge to help someone you know. I really want to raise awareness on this topic and I basically just wanted to right the wrong of my previous video about Hopeless Peaches. Even though you probably won't think it's like a really big deal, it's... I still felt like I had to talk about it, you know? And hopefully this video addresses those people that wasn't really happy with how I handled things in that video and it's less so because I want to please people like I came to the realization a couple of days ago that I can't please everyone but this is a topic that's genuinely close to me and something I'm genuinely passionate about so it's I felt it was really important for me to do right by it and I hope I succeeded. But anyway, thank you guys so much for watching to the end of this video. 
please check out my comic. I would be very happy if you did that. Follow me on all my social media and join my Discord server if you want to chat with me and some of my friends. I would be really happy to see you there. We give helpful art feedback and critiques to help each other improve. And I just genuinely like sort of looking at other people's artworks and seeing what I can learn from them. I'm actually quite keen to do another speed draw in someone else's art style, maybe other artists that I admire because I ended up picking up so many things like learning so many tricks and tips from trying to draw like Lavender Town. So I might do more of that in the future. And if you guys want to see more content like this, please like and subscribe. And with that, goodbye!